Hello, I'm Harry Glorikian. Welcome to The Harry Glorikian Show, the interview podcast that explores how technology is changing everything we know about healthcare. Artificial intelligence, big data, predictive analytics. In fields like these, breakthroughs are happening much faster than most people realize. If you want to be proactive about your own healthcare and the healthcare of your loved ones, you'll need to learn some of these new tips and techniques of how medicine is changing and how you can take advantage of all the new options. Explaining this approaching world is the mission of the new book I have coming out soon, The Future You. It's also our theme here on the show, where we bring you the conversations with innovators, caregivers, and patient advocates who are transforming the healthcare system and working to push it in positive directions. Chances are, you or your loved one has had a biopsy to check for cancer. Doctors got a tissue sample, and then they sent it into a pathology lab, and at some point, you got a result back. If you were lucky, it was negative and there was no cancer. But have you ever wondered exactly what happens in between those steps? Well, until recently, it's been an extremely meticulous manual process. A pathologist would create a very thin slice of your tissue, put it under a high-powered microscope, and examine the cells by eye, looking for patterns that indicate malignancy. But recently, the process has started to go digital. For one thing, the technology to make a digital scan of a pathology slide has been getting cheaper. That's a no-brainer, since it makes it way easier for a pathologist to share an image if they want a second opinion. But once the data is available digitally, it opens up a bunch of additional possibilities, including letting computers try their hand at pathology. That's what's happening at a company called Page AI, which makes a newly FDA-approved test for prostate cancer called Page Prostate. The test uses computer vision and machine learning to find spots on prostate biopsy slides that look suspicious, so a human pathologist can take a closer look. So why should you care? Well, in a clinical study that Page submitted to the FDA, pathologists who had help from the Page system accurately diagnosed cancer almost 97% of the time, up from 90% without the tool. That translates into a 70% reduction in false negatives. At the same time, there was a 24% reduction in false positives. I gotta tell you, if I were getting a prostate biopsy, I'd like those improved odds. And it's a great example of the kinds of AI-driven medical technologies that I wrote about in The Future You, which is now available from Amazon in Kindle ebook format. So I asked Page's CEO, Leo Grady, to come on the show to explain how the test works, how Page trained its software to be more accurate than a human pathologist, how the company got the FDA to give its first ever approval for an AI-based pathology product and what it could all mean for the future of cancer diagnosis and treatment. Here's our conversation. Leo, welcome to the show. Hi, Harry. Glad to be here. Yeah. You know, I've been watching the... the the company for some time now. And the big story here seems to be that we're really entering the area of digital pathology, also known as sort of computational pathology. And it's funny because I've been talking about digital pathology since I think I started my career back when I was 25, which seems like a long time ago at this point. But for a lot of laboratory tests that we use, like it's usually done by eye. And, and now we can get a lot from sort of AI uh, being assistive in this way. So keeping in mind that some of the listeners um, are professionals, but we have a bunch of sort of non-experts. Could you start off explaining the term, maybe computational pathology and summarize where the state of the art is, which I assume you guys are right at the cutting edge of it. Yeah, so I think it actually might help just to jump back a level and and talk about what is pathology and how is it done today. Um, So today, so pathology is the branch of medicine 
where a doctor is taking tissue out of a patient uh, through a biopsy, through surgery, and making glass slides out of that tissue, looking at it under a microscope in order to make a diagnosis. And today, all of that process of taking the tissue out, cutting it, staining it, mounting it on slides, then gets looked at under a microscope by a pathologist to make a diagnosis. And that diagnosis the pathologist makes is the definitive diagnosis that then drives all of the rest of the downstream management and care of that patient. When pathologists are looking through a microscope, uh, sometimes they see something that they're not quite sure what it is. And so they may wanna do another test. They may wanna do another stain. They may wanna cut more out of the tissue, make a second slide. Sometimes they want to ask a colleague uh, for their opinion, or if they really feel like they need an expert opinion, they may want to send that case out for a consultation, in which case the glass slides are, are put in a, you know, uh, in FedEx and basically shipped out to another lab somewhere. Um, all of those different scenarios can be improved with digital pathology and particularly computational pathology and the sort of technology that we build at PAGE. So in a, a digital world, what happens instead is that the slides don't go to the pathologist as glass. Uh, they go into a digital slide scanner and those slide scanners produce a very high resolution picture of these slides. So, you know, these are quarter micron resolution images that get produced of each slide. And then the pathologist has a work list on their monitor. They look through those, those cases, they open them up. And then in that digital workflow, they can see the slides digitally. Uh, when they have those slides digitally, if they wanna send them out to a second opinion or, or show them to a colleague, it's much easier to then you know, send those cases electronically than it is to actually ship the glass from one location to another. Once those slides are digital, it, it opens up a whole other set of possibilities for how uh, information can come to the pathologist. So if they want additional information about something that they see in those slides, rather than doing another stain, doing another cut, sending for a second opinion, uh, what we can do and what we do at PAGE is we, we identify all the tissue patterns in that piece of tissue match those against a large database where we have known diagnoses and say, okay, this case, this pattern here uh, has a high match toward to something that's in this database. And by providing that information to the pathologist uh, on request, that pathologist can then leverage that information, integrate it and use it in their diagnostic process. And this is the product that the FDA just approved is the first ever uh, AI-based product in pathology that is specifically aimed at prostate cancer and providing this additional information in the context of a prostate needle core biopsy. Well, congratulations on that. That's, you know, that's a, amazing. Um, and I'm, you know, the fact that the FDA is being more progressive than I remember them being right, in the past is also a great thing to see. But, you know, we've been talking and, and uh, quote, digitizing things in pathology for, for quite some time, let's say separate from the AI-based analytics part of it, uh, moving in that direction. What was the kind of technology advance or, or prerequisite that you guys came up with when you started PAGE? That, that took this to that next level? Well, the, as you're pointing out, Harry, that most slides are not digitized today. Uh, single digits of, of slides in a clinical setting get digitized. And the reason for that has been, uh, you need to buy scanners, you need to change your workflow, you need to digitize these slides. They're enormously large from a file size and data complexity. So then you have to store them somehow and you make all of that investment. <clears throat> and then you get to look at the same slide on a monitor that you look at under a microscope. And so pathologists 
for years have said, why, why would we make this investment? Why would we go through all of that expense and that trouble and that change and learn a new instrument when we don't really get a lot of value out of doing so? Um, and furthermore, there was even a question for a long time. Do you get the same information on a digital side that you get on glass through a microscope? Yep. There have been a number of things that have been changing that over time. Um, so one is the maturity of the, the high capacity digital side scanners. There are now a number of hardware vendors that produce these. <clears throat> Storage costs have come down. Yep. And one thing that we offer at Page is, is cloud storage, uh, which is really um, low cost because we're able to effectively pool um, costs with the cloud providers from multiple different labs and hospitals. So we can really drive those prices down as far as possible. So that lowers that barrier. And, um, and then back in 2017, the first digital side scanner got approved which demonstrated there was equivalency in the diagnosis between um, looking at the, the slide on a monitor and looking at it under a microscope. And that is something that, that we also replicated with our digital side viewer, demonstrated that equivalency between uh, digital and glass. But all of those barriers were, were barriers just to going digital in the first place. And now really for the first time, because of the maturity of the scanners, because of the FDA clearance of just the viewer, because of lower cost storage, many of those barriers have come down. Now, what, what has not happened is still a major clinical benefit for going digital in the first place. Yes, you can share slides easier. Yes, you can retrieve slides easier. Yes, you can do education easier it's still a lot of cost and a lot of change to your workflow. So I, I really think that, that the introduction of the kinds of technologies that, that the FDA approved, which we built with Page Prostate, that actually adds additional information into the diagnostic workflow that can help pathologists use that information, uh, help them get to a better diagnosis, um, reduce false positives, reduce false negatives, which is what we showed in the study. That for the first time is, is going above and beyond just going digital and some of these conveniences of a digital workflow to pro providing true clinical benefit. Yeah, I mean, whenever I look at this from an investment perspective, like if you take apart something and break it into its first principles, you know, levels, you, you, you have to have certain milestones hit, otherwise it's not gonna come together, right? Um, and I, I, you know, looking at digital pathology, it's the same thing. You have to have certain pieces in place for the next evolution to be possible because it's got to be built on top of these foundational pieces. But you know, once you get there, the exponential nature of, of how things change once it's digitized and once you're utilizing it and prove that it works is sort of where you see the you know, large leaps of benefit for the pathologist, as well as, you know, ultimately we're doing this for better patient care. Um, I, you know, your product was, I think the FDA called it first ever FDA approval for an AI product in pathology, which is a big deal, at least as far as I'm concerned, because I've been doing it for a long time. Um, but because it was first, it must have been a one hell of a learning process uh, for you and the FDA to figure out how to evaluate a test like this. Can you sort of explain maybe a little bit about the process? Um, you know, how did you win approval? What novel questions did you have to answer? It was a long process. Um, you know, as you point out, this is, this is the first ever technology uh, approved in this space. And I think you saw from the, the FDA's own press release, uh, their enthusiasm for what this technology can bring to patient benefits. Um, fortunately, we applied for a breakthrough designation back in early uh, 2019, received that, that breakthrough designation in, in February of 2019. And as a result, uh, one of the benefits of breakthrough designation is it the FDA commits to working closely with the company to try to uh, 
iterate on the study protocol, iterate on the, the validation that's going to be required in order to bring the, the technology to market. And so because of that breakthrough de uh, designation, we had the opportunity to work with the, the FDA in a much uh, tighter iterative loop. Mm -hmm. And I think that they are, they were concerned, I mean, primarily about um, the impact of a, a misdiagnosis in pathology, right? But, which is really understandable, right? The, um, right. you know, their view is that, yes, maybe in, in radiology, you see something and, and you maybe aren't totally sure, but then there's always pathology as a safety net, you know, in case you ever really need to resolve a, a ground truth, you can always take the tissue out and look at it under a microscope. But when you're, when you're dealing with a product for pathology, that's the end of the road. I mean, that is where the diagnostic buck stops. And so anything there that, that was perhaps going to misinform a pathologist, mislead them, uh, you know, ultimately lead to a negative conclusion for the patients could have more severe consequences. The flip side, of course, though, is that if you get it right, the benefits are much greater because you can really positively impact the, the care of those patients. So I, I think they, they, you know, appropriately were concerned with the exacting rigor of the study uh, to really ensure that, that this technology was providing benefit. And also because it was the first um, I think they wanted to be able to set a standard for future technologies that would have to, to live up to the same bar. So there were a lot of um, meetings, you know, a lot of trips down to Silver Springs. Um, but I, I have to say that, that the FDA, you know, I, I, I think in technology, there are a lot of companies that are, are quick to, um, <clears throat> you know, malign regulators and, and rules. I, I frankly, both at Page, my previous experience at HeartFlow, at Siemens, I, I think the FDA brings a very uh, consistent and important standard of clinical trial design of, of you know, technology proving that it is safe and effective. And I, I found them to be great partners to work with in order to really identify what that protocol looks like to be able to produce the validation and then to, you know, ask some tough questions, but that's their job. And I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, the products that get produced that go through that process really have met the standard of, of not only clinical validation, but even things like security and quality management and, and other really important factors of a clinical product. Oh, no, I'm in total agreement. I mean, whenever I'm talking to a company and they're like, well, I don't know when I'm going to go to the agency, I'm like, go to the agency. Like, yeah. don't wait till the end. Like, they are actually, you need to look at them as a partner, not as an adversary. Um, yeah, and, and so. a pre-submission pre meeting is, is easy to do. It's an opportunity to, uh, you know, make a proposal to the FDA and to understand how they think about it. And whether that's that's going to be a strategy that that's going to be uh, effective and workable for them. So I always think that that pre subs are are the the place to start uh, before you do too much work um, because you you generally know whether you're on the right path or not. Yeah, agreed. And it's funny because you said like you know they're they're concerned about the product, but it's interesting like from all the College of American Pathology studies where you send slides to different people, you don't always get the exact same answer, depending on who's looking at it. So um, I can see how a product can bring some level of standardization to the process that, that helps make the call so uniform, even across institutions when you send the slides. So I think that's moving the whole field in a really positive direction. Well, only if that uniform um, call is correct, right? Or, or if it's yes, better agreed. than what would be achieved. I mean, if you bring everybody down to the lowest common denominator, that that standardization, but it's not moving the field forward. So, correct. The you know one of the the curses of of bringing that level of standardization is that you have to really meet the highest bar of the highest pathologists, 
um, and not not just the average. That said, you know we're fortunate to come from Memorial Sloan Kettering um, and to have the opportunity to work with some of the the leading pathologists in the world to really uh, build in that level of rigor and, and excellence into the, the technology. Yeah, so that brings me to like, you know, the algorithms are built on a fairly large training set would be my assumption and, and of pre-labeled sort of images. Where do you guys source that from? Is it, um, you have like a thousand people in the background sort of making sure that everything is labeled correctly before it's fed to the, to the you know, to the algorithm itself? Well, what, what you're describing is very common uh, where you have pathologists or in radiology, radiologists or other experts really marking up images and saying, this is the important part to pay attention to. This part's cancer, that part's benign. Our technology actually works differently. Uh, our founder, uh, Thomas Fuchs and, and his team at Memorial Sloan Kettering actually uh, really made a breakthrough, not only in the, the quality of, of some of the, the AI systems they were building, but also in the technology itself. And what, what they did, uh, it's all published in Nature Medicine a couple of years ago, um, is basically find a way to uh, just show the computer a slide and the final diagnosis without having a pathologist you know, mark up the slide, but just show them mm -hmm. the final diagnosis. And when you show the computer enough examples of the slide and the final diagnosis, the computer starts to learn to say, okay, uh, this pattern is common to all grade threes. This pattern is common to all grade fours or, or whatever it is. And the, the computer learns to identify those patterns without anybody going through and marking those up. And what we find is that even though we were able to, or well, this technology is important for a few reasons. One, that means we can train systems at enormous scale. We can yep. not just do thousands of cases, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cases. Second, it means that we can really build out a portfolio of technologies quickly that are, are very robust um, mm -hmm. and not have to spend years annotating slides. And third, it allows us to start looking for patterns uh, that no pathologist would necessarily know how to mark up. You know, can we identify which tumors are going to respond to certain drugs or certain therapies? You know, no pathologist is going to be able to say, okay, it's this part of the, the, the tumor that you need to look at because they don't really know. But with this technology where we, we know these tumors responded, these tumors didn't, it actually helps us try to ferret out those patterns. So that, that's one of the real key benefits that differentiates Page from, from other companies in this space is just the difference in the technology itself. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I must admit, like when we talk about stuff like this, I get super excited because I can see like where things can go. It's, it's always difficult to explain it where somebody else can envision what you've been thinking about because you've been thinking about it so long, but it's super exciting. So let's jump to like the most important benefits. Like if you had to, to rank the benefits of the technology, I mean, I've, I read on your website that in the clinical study you guys submitted to the FDA, pathologists used using the, the page prostate were 7% more likely uh, to correctly diagnose the cancer. The percentage I think went up from 89.5 to 86.8. Like is that the major in innovation or, or would that by itself be enough to justify an investment in the technology? I mean, I'm trying to, you know, if, if you were to say, God, this is the most important thing and then go down the list, what would they be? Yeah, that, that's right. So, uh, so the study that we did was like this. We had 16 pathologists. They diagnosed about 600 prostate needle core biopsy patients. Um, and they, they did their diagnosis, they recorded it, and then they did it a second time using PAGE so they could see the benefit of all this pattern matching that, that PAGE had done for them. And what we did is we compared the diagnosis they got the first time and the second time with the ground truth consensus diagnosis that we had from Memorial. And what we found is that when the pathologists were using page, 
they had a 70% reduction in false negatives. Mm -hmm. They had a 24% reduction in false positives. And their uh, interest in a, obtaining additional information uh, went down because they had more confidence in the, the diagnosis that they were able to provide. And what was interesting about that 16 group of 16 pathologists is it, it included pathologists that were experienced, that were less experienced, some that were specialists in prostate cancer, some that were not so specialized in, in prostate cancer. And among that entire group of pathologists, they all got better. They all benefited from using this technology. And what's more is that the, the gap between the less experienced, less specialized pathologists and more experienced, more specialized pathologists actually decreased as they all use the technology. So it allowed them to, like we were talking about before, actually come up to the level of, of the better pathologists and even the better pathologists could leverage the information to get even better. So as a male who had, you know, who's gonna age at some point and potentially have to deal with, hopefully not a prostate issue, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We want them to make an accurate diagnosis because you don't want the inaccurate diagnosis, especially in, in that sort of an issue. But what about the speed? I mean, you've, you, you talk about that, um, you know, it, it helps streamline the process and reduce, reduce turnaround time for, for patients. Um, what does that do to sort of the workload and and how quickly you're able to, to turn that around compared to say a traditional method our study was really focused on clinical benefit and patient benefit uh, we were not aiming to measure speed and the way in which the study was designed and the, and the device is intended to be used is that the pathologist would look at the case decide what they they think the result is and then pull up the page results and see if it changes them, their, their thinking or calls their attention to something that they may have missed. So the focus of the, the product was really on the, the benefit to the, the clinical diagnosis and the, the clinical benefit to, to patients uh, by providing more information to the, the doctors. And you know the result of that information was you know, clearly demonstrated benefit. Now, if they can get to that result by looking at the page results and they don't need another cut, they don't need another stain, they don't need another consultation, then that's going to get the results back to the urologist faster, back to the patient faster, and will ultimately, you know, enable them to start acting on that diagnosis more quickly. Um, but the, the intention of the study, the, the intended use of the device is not around making pathologists faster. It's really around providing them this additional information so that they can use that in the course of their diagnosis and get to better results for patients. So I asked this out of naivete because I didn't, I, I, I didn't go looking for it, but have you guys done a health economic analysis of the system? Uh, we have one. Uh, it's certainly, it's, it's, as you know, it's really key to be able to look at that. We have a model um, that we've built. Uh, we're still refining it with additional data. Um, there was a study that was announced in the UK um, a couple weeks ago where the NHS is actually uh, funding a prospective multicenter trial um, that includes Oxford, uh, Warwick, Coventry, Bristol, um, to be able to uh, evaluate the, the health economics and clinical benefits of using this technology in clinical practice prospectively. Uh, so that's something that we, you know, we engaged with NICE on in order to try to get the design correct. Um, <laughs> that will help feed in real world data into yep. the, the model. Uh, but we have a model that we've been using uh, internally and are continuing to build and refine. So again, incredible that you guys got <clears throat> FDA approval. I think the company was founded in 2017, if I'm correct. Um, can you talk about you know, the founders and 
how you guys, you know, built this so quickly. I mean, this is, it's not time scale wise, it's a pretty compressed time scale, relatively speaking. Well, yeah, it is and it isn't. So the, the company uh, started in 2017. Our first employee was actually 20, middle of 2018. Uh, and we had our first venture round in, in early 2018. Um, however, the, the work I, that went into the company that spun out of Memorial Sloan Kettering started earlier. So there's um, a group of, of really visionary individuals at MSK that uh, back, I, I want to say 2014, 2015, actually had started this push toward digital pathology, computational pathology, really seeing where the, the puck was going and building this technology. They formed something called the Warren Alpert Center. And the Warren Alpert Center uh, provided some initial funding to, to really get this going and to hire some of the, the founders and to, to really move this technology in the right direction. And it was really because that technology started to show such promise um, that MSK made the decision that that was at a point where it could be better, you know, more impactful to actually go outside of MSK into a company where, where we could industrialize the technology and really bring it uh, to hospitals and labs around the world. So the, the technology started, you know, earlier, 2014, 2015. Uh, Page was really launched in, I would say, 2018, although technically it was incorporated earlier. <laughs> and, um, and then from that point, I personally joined in 2019. And um, so I'm not, I'm not a founder. Uh, but when I joined in 2019, you know, we, we really spun up a significant team and, and brought to bear some of, you know, my own experience in industrializing AI technology and bringing it out to clinical benefit. Uh, you know, most founders don't take the company all the way. It's a, it's a rare, it's a rare breed that's able to get it that far. So, um, you know, this, this is a, a great story, but let's step back here and talk about like, now you have to like get people to accept this technology, right? Which is the human factor, which I always find, you know, much more confounding than the, 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 the computational factor. So you got to get, you know, somebody inside a hospital or pathology lab do you run into resistance or pushback from the technology? I mean, is, are they skeptical about the algorithm? Um, you know, how do you get them? How do you get a human to sort of buy off on this? I remember when we were presenting this, oh God, again, 25 years ago, they hated it. I mean, just <laughs> hated it. Um, and as time has gone by, you've seen that that digitization is slowly taking effect and where, you know, it's assistive as opposed to something. I remember when we first launched this, it was, this is going to be better than or take your job, um, which is a great way to make a, an enemy on the other side. And I don't, I, I see it's, these it's technologies of being, yeah, and, and I see the, the two actually being better than one or the other per se on, on its own. So how are you guys approaching this? And do you have any anecdotal stories that you might be able to share? Yeah, and so I think there, there are two elements there. One is, you know, are people resistant by the nature of the technology because they feel threatened by it? And then the other is, you know, how does market adoption start uh, with this sort of technology? Uh, to address the first point, you know, I, I, I tend to be very careful about the term AI. I feel like it, you know, it often uh, introduces this concept of, you know, of people think of a robot doctor that's going to run in and start doing things. And, and it's just, it's not, I mean, the AI is a technology that's been in development for, for decades. Uh, I did my PhD in, in AI and computer vision 20 years ago. And this is just, it's just, it's a technology, right? It's like a transistor. It can be used to build many different things. Um, at its core, it's just complex pattern matching, uh, which is what we 
how we leverage that technology in the case of page prostate was to you know, help provide that information. I think you know, the better frame to think about this technology is as a diagnostic. Um, you know, this is just like a diagnostic test. You validate it with a standalone sensitivity and specificity. The information gets provided to the doctor. You have to do a clinical trial that you know, samples the space effectively of the patient population and the intended use. And you have to make sure the doctors understand the information and know how to use it effectively. Uh, it's before my time, but I heard that when immunohistochemistry was first really introduced in pathology, that there was a discussion that this was going to take all the pathologist's job and who needs a pathologist if you can just stain with IHC and get, get a diagnostic result out of it. Well, you know, 20 years, 10, 20 years later, there, you know, IHC is an essential component of, of pathology and it's, it's a, a key element of, of the diagnostic workflow for pathologists. So far from replacing any pathologists, it's, it's empowered them, it's made their, the benefit that they can provide to the, back to the clinicians even more valuable and even more important. Um, and I, I think we're gonna see a similar trajectory with this computational technology. Now, to your first question about a market adoption, how are people adopting this? I would say that, um, you know, last week I went to the College of American Pathology meeting, which was in person in Chicago. It's my first in-person meeting <laughs> since COVID, uh, so a year and a half ago. And I, I noted, and this was, this was right after the announcement by the FDA of, of the um, approval for page prostate. I noticed there was a marked shift in the conversations I was having with pathologists. It was a shift away from, does this technology work? Is it ready for prime time? What does it really do toward, okay, how do we operationalize this? How do we bring it in house? How do we integrate this into a workflow? And how do we, how do we pay for it? You know, those are the conversations that uh, we were having in Chicago at, at CAP, uh, not does this work? Is it ready for prime time? So I, I do think that there is a, um, a marked understanding that the technology is real, that it works, that it can provide benefit. Now it's just a question of how do we operationalize and how do we you know, get it paid for? Uh, because today there's no additional reimbursement for it. Um, but, you know, again, with market adoption, there's, you know, the, the there's the more adoption curve for anything, right? Yep. I mean, you've got your yep. innovators and your early adopters, your early majority, late majority, and your laggards. And, you know, where I think we're at a stage where we've got innovators and early adopters that are excited to to jump in and start leveraging this technology. And I think, you know, we're we're going to, get to your early majority and the late majority over time. It's, it's always going to be a process. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, reflecting on your IHC, that's where I started my career. Like I, I, oh, I, really? think I, 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 I taught like 250 IHC courses over the first say three years that I was in the, in the business three or four years. And uh, you know, I agree with you. It's, it's, you know, there's no way that any one of these technologies takes the place up. I mean, they're, they're additive, right? They're, it's just a tool that helps make the circle much more complete than it would be in any one component all by itself. So um, did you ever hear when you were teaching these classes, did anyone ever say that? Like, are we even gonna need pathologists anymore? No, it was when the, is, is when imaging systems came out that said the imaging system would then replace the pathologist. The IHC was, was really the, the cusp of precision medicine, right? Where I remember when I first started, because um, we were working with ER and PR. Right. And, uh, you know, when I first learned, you know, about like, you know, the find and grind method, I would always be like, okay, it's X number of fentanyls. Like, what is that really telling you, right? Compared to this stain over here where I can see, you know, the anatomy, I can see where the cells are. I can see, I mean, there's so much more information that's coming from this that lets me make a better call. Um, I will tell you, selling it was not that hard to a lot of people. They, 
they could see the benefit um, and you could you could really sort of get them to adopt it uh, because they was saw that, it as a tool. Was that post reimbursement? Uh, even pre reimbursement. Really interesting. Yeah. Um, oh, I, there's there's a lot we can learn from you then. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was uh, it was an interesting ride back then. I mean, I remember my first day at work. Um, my boss comes to me and says, by the way, you're going to give a talk in Arizona in two weeks. And I was like, what do you mean I'm going to give? Who am I going to give a talk to? He goes, oh, you got to give uh, a talk on the technology and how to use it. And uh, I said, who's in the audience? And he said, Histotex, and there'll be some pathologists. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and he goes, you got two weeks to get ready. Oh my God, I was cramming like crazy. I was in the lab. I was doing all the different types of assays that we had available. And, you know, it was, you went out there and I learned very quickly, like the show must go on. Like you got to get out there and you got to do your thing. Um, but it was, it was a great time in my career to be on that, on that bleeding edge of what was happening. So um, quickly, like, why did you guys start with, prostate cancer though like it's not the most common cancer although it's high on the list so or maybe it's the second most type of cancer but why did you guys start with that and and where do you guys see it going from there i guess is next well the the decision of how to rank the um different opportunities for you know ultimately we believe this technology can benefit really the entire diagnostic process, no matter what the question is in pathology. Um, however, we did have to prioritize, right? And, <laughs> and the elements of, of where to start, right? The elements of prioritization um, had a few factors. So one factor was how, how prevalent is the disease, right? I mean, as you know, prostate cancer is one of the big four. Um, second, is there a lot of tissue? Is there a lot of benefit that we can provide? Uh, today with prostate cancer, you know, man of a certain age goes in, gets a PSA test, it's high. They go and they get 12 cores, 14 cores, 20 cores out of their prostate. And that produces, you know, it can be 30 slides, it can be 50 slides. I mean, it really depends. And this can take the pathologist a long time to look through most of those cores are negative. In fact, most of those patients are negative. Um, but the consequence of missing something is really significant. And so we thought that this was a, a situation where there was a big need. There was a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of screening that goes on with prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is prevalent. And the consequence of missing something is really significant. Um, so that's where we felt like we could provide maximum benefit, both in terms of the, the patient, in terms of the doctor, um, and also that it was a significant need across the space. Um, we also had the, the data and the technology that we could go after that one uh, well. Um, but that said, you know, we announced that we have a, a breast cancer product that is uh, got a CE mark uh, in en enabling clinical use in Europe. Uh, we're, we're doing a number of investigational studies with that product in the U.S. Uh, right now and um, and working toward bringing that one to market. Um, you know, after our, our recent funding rounds, we've, we've spun up a number of teams, a number of, of uh, verticals that we're, at, we're going after uh, in other cancer types and, and ultimately even beyond cancer. So there, there's more to come. Uh, we wanted, we really take seriously the quality, the, um, you know, the regulatory confirmation, um, as well as the deployment channel. I mean, we built the whole workflow to be able to leverage this technology throughout the workflow in a way that is meaningful to the pathologist. So the development is, is maybe a little bit more um, heavy and, and validation than some other companies where you have a PhD student that says, oh, you know, I won some challenge and I'm gonna go, you know, bring this to market. 
Um, building real clinical products, validating them, deploying them, supporting them is, is a real endeavor. Um, but prostate was just the first, breast is, is second, and we have a whole pipeline coming out, so stay tuned. So before we end here, I want to just tilt the lens a little bit towards the consumer and say like, you know, why would consumers like show interest or, or at least be aware that these things are coming? Because I always feel like <laughs> they're almost the last to know or they just don't know at all. But, you know, in the future, you know, with technologies like this, do you see it uh, identifying tumors sooner, uh, faster, more accurately, or, you know, will it, will it help increase survival or help us find better drugs? I mean, that, that that's, I think what people are really, if you, if you went down one level from us, uh, of, of the people that are affected by this, th those are the sorts of things they'd want to know. Well, I think, you know, a, a useful analogy is what happened with the Da Vinci robot. You know, when, when it was necessary for a patient to get prostate cancer surgery, um, they often chose centers that had the Da Vinci robot. Uh, why? Because they believed that they were able to get better care at those centers. And it's not because the surgeons at the other centers were no good. It's because the, the Da Vinci added elements of precision and standardization and accuracy that could be demonstrated that would uh, enable the, the patient to feel more confident they're getting the best treatment at those centers. So as I think about page prostate and, and you know, ultimately the other uh, technologies that we're bringing to market beyond that, I would imagine that from the standpoint of the patient, they would want the diagnosis done at a lab where they had access to all of the, the available information, all of the latest technology mm -hmm. that could inform the pathologist to uh, get the right answer, right? So would you want to go to a lab where the pathologist had no access to IHC? Would you want to, to send it to a lab where the pathologist had no ability to do a consultation? Um, do you want to send your, your sample to a lab where the pathologist doesn't have access to PAGE? I think in the future, the answer is going to be no. Um, and I think that we're going to see ultimately insurance companies and, and Medicare recognize that those labs are able to provide better care to patients and are going to um, encourage them and incentivize them to adopt these technologies. So, you know, if, ultimately from a patient standpoint, they, they, want to choose centers where they're going to get the best care, they're going to get the best diagnosis. I think one of the exciting elements of digital technology is that not everybody's able to go to Memorial Sloan Kettering. Not everyone's able to go to MD Anderson or Mayo Clinic. Um, I think the opportunity with digital technology is to really uh, increase the accessibility, increase the availability of, of these diagnostic tools that can really empower and enable pathologists in many parts of America, as well as beyond, to really get to better results for their patients. And ultimately, you know, every patient cares about getting those, those results accurately for themselves and for their loved ones. Yeah, I mean, I'm always explaining to, you know, to different people, like, once you digitize it, like, there's so many opportunities that may open up to make things better, faster, easier, more accurate, um, and even start to shift the business model itself of what can be done and where it can be done. So it's, it's a super exciting space. And uh, thanks for taking the time. It was, it was great to talk to you. I mean, I don't get to talk to people in pathology all the time anymore. I'm sort of all over the place, but uh, it's, uh, it's near and dear to my heart, that's for sure. Well, thank you so much, Harry. We're, we're so excited by, by these recent developments with the, the first ever FDA approved technology in this space. And um, you know, really excited to help roll this out to 
labs and hospitals around the country and around the world to, to really benefit those doctors and patients. Excellent. Well, I look forward to hearing about the next FDA approval. Working on it. Look forward to telling you. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Harry. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.